with me for a word of prayer for a moment. Father, we're so thankful, God, to call upon your name today, and we appreciate you giving us another Sunday, Father. The Lord's Day is special to us, and it's your day, Father, and your people are in your house. Lord, they're honoring you by their, their presence here. We want to worship you. We want to bless you. Father, we've had opportunity to praise you in song. And Father, now we submit yourself, ourselves to your word. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would move amongst us and that you would teach and that you would challenge. That you'd help us have a better understanding how we can serve you. Father, I thank you so much for the, the visitors and the return visitors you've given us this morning. It's a, an ex exciting thing, Lord, to have a church, Lord, that has life in it. And Lord, we ought to have life because you're... Uh, Son Jesus is alive and well and in heaven with you, and he continues to reign. And, Lord, we want him to reign over our hearts. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for the work you've done. We thank you for the salvation we have through your shed blood upon the cross. And so, Father, for the next few moments, we want you to bless us, but we also want to bless you but with attentive hearts and open minds. God bless the children in the back. We pray your blessings over them this week as they return, many of them, to school. And Lord, all of our workers at school, all the uh, employees, all the adults that work tirelessly to minister to our children in education, we pray your blessings this week. And Father, we ask God for the next few minutes that you'll speak to our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, and if, I, if you will, I would ask that you would find uh, uh, Genesis chapter 6 and hold your finger there because we'll be getting over there shortly. But we do want to get one verse out of Hebrews chapter 11 before we do so. One of the ploys <coughs> of Satan throughout history has been to mislead people about the way to salvation. What he wants to do, what he, he, his effort is to confuse us or confuse people about faith and works. Primarily, he wants to persuade people, <coughs> excuse me, to persuade people that they can be saved by doing good works. And if he's effective in making that, uh, people, he's effective in making people believe that, then those individuals will never be genuinely saved, and that's just one more person that he can keep in his grips. Furthermore, the old devil wants to distort in the minds of Christians along the way uh, their understanding of faith and works and the importance of them. He wants us to be out of balance, Christians. He wants us to uh, not be able to understand faith and works. He wants us to uh, be on one extreme or the other. One extreme uh, is that we have to do good works in order to maintain our salvation. That's not true, but that's legalism. He wants us to lean in that direction. If he can't get us to lean in that direction, the second extreme is, is hey, I'm saved so I can do whatever I want. I don't have to do good works. That is not true either, and that's what would be considered license. You understand what I'm saying? One extreme <coughs> says, Hey, I've got to jump through hoops in order to keep myself in the family of God. The other extreme says, hey, I can live any, one, any way I want because I'm already saved. Neither extreme is healthy. Neither extreme is right. The Bible makes it clear that we're saved by grace through faith. And <clears throat> it also makes clear that good works should follow us after that. The good works don't follow to maintain salvation, but rather to show the authenticity of our faith. Good works, watch this now, good works don't produce salvation, but salvation should produce good works. Do you get that? I hope you will be reminded of that. Good salvation, I mean, excuse me, good works don't produce salvation, but salvation should produce good works. The Bible says in James 2, verse 26, faith without works is dead. If we have true living faith, then it's going to be evident through fruitfulness in our life. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 says, for we are his workmanship 
created in Christ Jesus for good works. Now think about that for a moment. Created in Christ Jesus. That's once we're, we're saved and we're born again. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. Anything that is created for a purpose and does not carry out that purpose is going to be unfulfilled. Going to live a less than victorious life. A bird is created to fly. If that bird doesn't fly, then that bird is going to have an unfulfilled life. That bird, if he has wings, but he chooses to just walk around with his feet on earth, he's going to be unfulfilled, and somebody's going to probably confuse him for a penguin. And the same thing in our life, if we're Christians and we don't have good works, which we were created for, somebody's going to confuse us for a lost person. They're not going to see that we're children of God. So, don't make any mistake about it. A Christian is to have good works. It's important. So, in Hebrews chapter 11, this is what we call the hall of faith in the Bible. It mentions numerous Bible heroes who prove their, the, the genuineness of their faith uh, by living obedient to God and doing good works. And perhaps no one person on this list stands out more uh, when it comes to obedience than Noah. And so we're going to look at verse 7 of Hebrews uh, chapter 11. And it says, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not yet seen, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. That verse suggests several things about Noah's life. Now, you can go back uh, to uh, Genesis chapter 6, and and you you can just light right there, and and, and we'll be there in a moment. This verse that we just read tells us several things about Noah's life. The first thing it tells us is that Noah listened to God. Noah was in a transitional time in history. At the time uh, that, that we're about to read, Uh, the time that God called upon Noah to build the ark, he and his boys were the last descendants in the godly line of Adam before the flood. And so as we turn back to Genesis chapter uh, 6, we'll see that the rest of the world had fallen apart. The rest of the world had become completely depraved and rebellious toward God, towards God, so much so that the Bible tells us, and now I told you to go there and I'm not there. Just one moment, let me get there. The Bible's going to tell us in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5, And God saw the wickedness of men, that every Uh, The wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continuously. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on earth, and it grieved him in his heart. Man had become so wicked that it broke God's heart. And it caused God to regret having created man. Now that's pretty stout stuff right there, isn't it? God, with a broken heart, sorry that he had made man. That's exactly what the Bible tells us. But Noah, Noah was an exception. I want you to notice verse 8. It says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. You see, Noah was an exception to the rule. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, and the Bible says he was a just man and perfect. That word just means means that he was right before God. And so you find out what came first, though. In verse 8, he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So Noah was saved by grace. And that made him a just man, verse 9, but it also says he was a perfect man. That's not meaning that Noah was flawless and didn't make mistakes. That, that it just simply means that he lived right before the Lord. And so you see, grace saved him. 
He had his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, or in, 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 in God, that was before Jesus Christ, of course, and that made him live righteously. So we have grace, faith, and works in that order. The works came because he was saved. The works didn't come to get him saved. They came because he was saved. Now I want you to notice again, verse six and ver- I mean chapter six and verse nine, it says that he walked with God. Noah walked with God. And think about this. He was walking with God in the midst of a very wicked world, somewhat like we're doing today. Pull this up on your screen for just a moment and zoom in. Everything on the planet was evil, the Bible says at that point. Everything had become corrupt and violent. It was a cesspool. It wasn't just bad. It was the worst. Verse 11 tells us, And the earth was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And... God, excuse me, and God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. You can imagine what it was like for Noah to be a child of God, he and his three boys. You can imagine the distractions. You can imagine the discouragement, the disillusionment, the disappointment that Noah experienced as he walked with God in such an evil environment, but he did it anyway. He did it anyway. And guess what? He was rewarded for doing so by hearing from God. Verse 13 says, And Noah, excuse me, and God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them uh, with the earth, along with the earth. It's, you see, God spoke to Noah amidst all of that chaos and all of that violence. And if you think you think can't hear from God, yes, you can. God still speaks today. God still deals with his children today. He doesn't deal, I mean, he still deals one-on-one. He doesn't deal with us in the same way as he did Noah as, as, as far as speaking audibly to him. But he speaks to us through Scripture. And He speaks to us through His Holy Spirit. He wants to reveal to you and I, in this chaotic world, in this violent world, in this corrupt world, He wants to reveal to you and I the things that He wants us to accomplish. The things that He wants us to do here on this earth. He wants to show us how to do good works. And folks, He had a pretty important work for Noah to do in that situation. Notice what he says in verse 14. He says, Make thee an ark of gopher wood, and make rooms uh, in the ark, and thou shalt pitch it within and without uh, with pitch. God says, Noah, I want you to build a boat. Why? He tells over in verse 17, it's because he's going to send a flood. He's going to bring a worldwide flood. Now, I don't know about you, but I'd say that building a boat before a worldwide flood, is pretty important work for Noah. You know what? You and I may not be given as quite as big a project uh, to do by the Lord, but all work that God calls upon us to do is important. Everything. Every last thing. We tend to get uh, in the mindset, well, uh, being a preacher or being a pastor or a missionary or a Sunday school teacher or an evangelist, that's important work. All the rest of that stuff is kind of negligible. And folks, that's the wrong mindset. Every work for God is important. No matter how small, uh, it's all important uh, uh, before God. And when you read in Matthew chapter 25, uh, towards the end of the chapter there, uh, Jesus is telling us about uh, 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 feeding the hungry and and giving the thirsty something to drink and and visiting strangers, uh, or excuse me, taking strangers in and visiting the sick and visiting those who are in prison and, and all of these things. And then he says, as much as ye did it unto the least of one of these, you've done it unto me. God says all those things are important. Jesus says all those things that I mentioned, even the small things, even a small visit to a sick person, is as if you have done it unto me. Friends, the the behind-the-scenes stuff, the uh, 
somewhat in the background type stuff that people do is important as well. In this church, the nursery workers, the, the cleaners, the, the people that, that pray, the choir members, the, the door greeters, the security guys uh, that, 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 that walk around back there just making th- sure things are safe, and the phone calls uh, that, that people make checking on other people, the visits that people make, all of this is a important stuff and it's a vital part of the ministry of this church but even just simply the people that attend church and are a part of corporate worship that too is important and it's not limited friends to to church ministry the moms and the dads who get up and get their children to church the moms and the dads who raise their children in the Lord that's important work the employee who works hard and shines for Jesus on the job, in the workplace, that's important work. The person that's just simply a good neighbor, a good Christian, has a good attitude and represents the Lord and has a good uh, testimony to other people that are around them, that's good work. The kid at school, that does the right thing, that doesn't fall in with any mischief, that the kid that makes their grades, the kid that chooses not to go partying but to do right, the kid that honors their father and mother, the kid that follows the rules, that's good work. And on and on and on the list goes. Not everyone is called to full-time ministry as far as vocation goes, but all people are called to full-time Christianity and doing good works, and all good works are important. So God has a lot of work for us to do, all of us. And if we will listen to Him, He'll speak to us, and He'll show us more that He wants us to do. Now I want you to notice uh, what else God told Noah. God wanted Noah to see the world around him as it really was. And to know that his judgment was coming. So in verse 13, again, God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me. For the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them, the people, with the earth. You know what God's saying here? This place stinks and I'm going to judge it. Friends, it's important that we as children of God have the proper perspective about the world that's around us and the world that's going to come or the, 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 the future that you and I have in Christ. The world around us is temporal and corrupt, but the heaven that lies before us is eternal and pure. God wants us to, to, to understand that. He wants to keep those things in balance. We all struggle in keeping balanced on those two issues. We're redeemed. We belong to the, 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 uh, the kingdom of heaven, but then we also wake up every morning and we throw our feet off the side of the bed and we step out into this temporal world. It's hard to keep that in balance sometimes. It's hard to keep those two things in their proper place. God wants to help us see how the world really is and see it for what, what it really is, but also keep our eyes on heaven and live accordingly. And he also wants to remind his friends that there will be a day of judgment. Just as God told Noah that, hey, I'm going to be sending a flood to judge the world, he has also told you and I that I'm going to be sending my son to judge the earth. My son will return. Folks, it's not a matter of if, it's when. Jesus is coming back. I wish he'd come back for lunch, folks. I really do. I'm ready. I'm fed up with this world. I'm fed up with the world around us. If the last six months hadn't been enough to wean us off this world, I don't know what ever will. People are after me all the time. Try to do something about your hearing. Do something about your hearing so you can hear what's going on around you. And I petition to you folks, I don't like half of what I'm hearing already. (laughs) Why am I going to get something so I can hear some more? I'm fed up. I'm fed up. This is a mess. This is a certified mess, and I'm ready to go to heaven, and I hope you are as well. God wants us to see it for what it is, not a doom and gloom, and oh, woe is me, I have to live on this earth, and everything's bad. That's not what He wants. He wants us to be shining lights, but He does want us to see it for what it is, and see that our home awaits us in heaven, something eternal. 
That's what he wants for us. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, as the scripture says. I'm ready to fly away. David sang. No, he didn't. He played the song. We played the song. Uh, I'll fly away at this service for Miss uh, uh, Edwards on, uh, on Friday. She was 101 years old. And, and we, it, the song says, I'll fly away. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. Folks, I'm ready to fly away. I'm ready. God wanted Noah to see the world as it really is, and he wants you and I to see the world as it really is. Now, I want you to notice Noah's obedience. Now, remember, James says, faith without works is dead. Noah had found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He had faith, and now that faith is going to come into play, and it's going to become evident through his good works. Notice verse 22, three words that start off the verse, thus did Noah. It doesn't say Noah hem hauled around. It doesn't say Noah thought about it for a little while. It doesn't say Noah entertained God's instructions for a little while. It doesn't say Noah made excuses. It says, thus did Noah. Is that you this morning? Can you put your name in there? Can you fill in the blank and, and substitute your name for Noah? Thus did Chris. Thus did Micah. Thus did David. Thus did Jeff. Thus did Laverne. Can you put your name in there? You might say, well, no, uh, God hadn't told me anything to do. Come on, folks. I beg to differ. God's told us all kinds of things to do. Mult I mean, the Bible is filled with countless things that God has told us to do. We don't need to wait for Him to tell us something else. We need to do what He's already told us to do. A fellow I used to work for, an older fellow, Larry Fincher, used to say, he used to have this saying, do what you know to do right now. If you've got something you know you're already supposed to do, you don't need to sit around waiting for God to tell you something new. And neither do I. That's a good motto on the job. Do what you know to do right now. Don't wait for the boss to come with something new. If you hadn't done what you already know to do, do what you know to do right now. God has told us a lot of things to do. He says, give and it shall be given unto you. We know to do that. He says, uh, pray. Pray without ceasing. We know to pray. He says, do all things without murmuring and complaining. Those are things we can do. He tells us to forgive as God has, for uh, Christ's sake, have forgiven us. He tells us to visit the poor. He tells us to feed the hungry. He tells us to witness for Christ. Go out and go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. He tells us to do a lot of things. We ought to do them. You know, he says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. You know what God's saying? Go to church. Go to church. You say, well, I've got concerns about COVID. Yeah, we all have had for a while, but folks, we've rode that as far as we can ride it. And so many of people are back because why? Because we're getting at a point where that's not a big concern anymore. Now, folks, I, I am one. I've tried to be balanced through this whole deal, uh, balanced uh, with a certain caution, but also with certain amount of uh, uh, realistic thoughts about the situation. And I think, honestly, I think we're past the page, uh, the, the place where people are fearful about this. If, if, you, if we're very fearful, our, cool, our kids wouldn't be going to school tomorrow. Now, again, I, legitimate concern for somebody that's elderly and has compromised health and this sort of thing, I totally get that, and I'm sympathetic to that, and I sure don't take issue with that. But also, I'm, I'm saying if we can, if we can get in a 100-mile-long line at Walmart or we can go to a restaurant that's packed out, and, and then we can go to church. One of our ladies texts Miss Tricia this, this week and says, uh, we're going to be back in church on Sunday. Uh, if we can go to school, we can go to church. I like that mentality. I like that. Now, folks that are still, again, with compromised health or are concerned, uh, legitimate concern, I, I, we miss you. We know you're going to be back, and you have to make that decision as you can. But for us that uh, perhaps have just gotten used to watching church in our pajamas and, 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 and have just gotten used to not, not, not getting up and getting a family together to go to, it's time to change, folks. It's time to get back to church. You know what? We don't want to wait till. Uh, till something tragic happens. We don't want to wait till our kids fall in rebellion or, or the bank's coming to foreclose on our home or, or uh, we get that cancer diagnosis. We don't want to wait till then to say, oh, I need to get back in church. 
We don't want to wait till then to be reminded how in church, how important church is. We are to be in the house of God when we can. And now we can, folks. And I don't want to sound ugly. But friends, my job is to not put together a bunch of spiritual sissies, but my job is to rally the Christian soldiers that God has placed in our care as a church and get them moving and get them marching. It's time to go back to church, friends. We've got a lot of work that we can be doing. We've got to do what we know to do right now. Verse 22, I want you to notice. Thus did Noah, watch this, according to all that God commanded him, he did so. According to all that God commanded him. Noah didn't get inducted into the hall of faith by partial obedience. He didn't get placed in there because of moderate faith. He did all the work. That God laid out for him. Folks can you imagine. Building a giant. Humongous boat. It's more like a. If you, if you uh, uh, figure the dimensions. And I'm not smart enough to do that. They say a cubit is, is from the elbow to the fingertips. Which is about 17, 18 inches. That's a, well when you take all that in consideration. The people that are smart. That I've read about. Say that that boat was. Uh, 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 about the size of a, a football field and a half. Pretty long boat. It's more like an ocean liner. And so for a hundred years plus, Noah worked sawing wood, measuring out dimensions and hammering nails and laying out plans and, and caulking the seams with pitch on the inside and out and, 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 and all of that. It got tough at times. It got difficult. It got mundane. It was probably somewhat at points uh, embarrassing perhaps when, when, when the world around him was <clears throat> walking by and laughing at him and, and wondering what he was doing and wondering why he was doing what he was doing. Just like they do oftentimes they scratch their head and don't understand why us Christians don't do this and don't do that and do do this and, and do do that. And they think, what are you guys doing? Why do you all do that? Sometimes you think, well, it is kind of, it is kind of embarrassing, and, and, and especially for young people. Noah probably at times got discouraged. He got tired. Noah had a lot of things going on, but one thing he did not do is he did not quit. He stayed the course, and he was obedient, and he did the works that were a product of his faith. Thus did Noah. And it was worth it, folks. I can assure you, when Noah and his boys and their wives and his wife, when they finally took that boat ride, when judgment was happening all around them, and the world around them that had been so depraved and so corrupt was in a big pickle, covered and undated with water, unlike anything they'd ever seen. And Noah was within the safety of that ark with his family. I can assure you that his obedience and his work paid off. <clears throat> can you say this morning, thus did and fill in your name. Thus did Tim. Thus did Philip. Thus did Susie. Thus did Terry. Thus did Jimmy. Thus did Bobby. Just did Charlotte. Can you put your name in there and honestly say, Thus did I. I did what God showed me to do. I did what I knew to do when I could do it. As we begin to have this altar call, I want you to ask yourself that question. I'm so glad to see so many of you. I told a young couple this week that was, uh, that, that was uh, uh, well, 
one of them, uh, JP, was helping us work on Saturday, and, and I told Summer on Sunday, I'm proud of you young people because, uh, uh, because it is. It's a, it's a different world we live in, and you're, you're in church. Our old people, I, we, they, just, they just go. <laughs> I just, I just, they've had too many years serving the Lord. They're not, not going to go. I mean, obviously, many of them have had health concerns and have had to miss, but by and large, what they can, they're just going to go. But the young people, they're the ones that are pulled in so many directions. And you're in the house of God this morning. And I commend you for being here. That's being a Christian soldier. That's not a spiritual sissy, folks. That's a Christian soldier. I'm going to ask you to stand as Brother David comes. You ask that question to yourself as we have this altar call. Can I honestly say, can God honestly say about me, thus did I? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If God's spoken to your heart, you come. Hey folks, we're certainly glad you were here today. And again, visitors, thank you for being with us. If you filled out a visitor's card, please drop it in the offering plate. It's on the back table as you dismiss from here. Folks, we're not taking up the offering, as you know, right now because of the passing of the place, just trying to cut down on the, uh, uh, the people, you know, perhaps uh, 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 risking somebody uh, being contaminated or whatever. But uh, uh, there are offering plates at the back if you have an offering you'd like to, to, to leave. And uh, also, just pray for these kids. Kids, go shine all week long at school. We know you're going to be safe. We're praying for you. And if you know parents, uh, any of you guys know parents of our kids that uh, uh, we've, we've lost a lot of kids through this COVID deal, and we want to get that built back up just as much as we want to get all of our services built back up. So I uh, urge those parents, if you see them, or if you can make a visit to some of these, uh, say, you know, the, the, the kids are going back to school. Can we have them back at church? And we'll all work hard. We'll get this group right over here filled back up, that little space, and get all these other spaces filled back up like it used to be, and we'll be in business, okay? Uh, tonight, choir practice cor cor correct at 5 o'clock, okay? Uh, come join the choir. Be, uh, to be getting back to normal around here to be able to hear the choir. Uh, so come be a part of that with them, okay? All right, glad you're here. Let's go ahead and be dismissed in a word of prayer. Lord bless you. Landon, will you lead us in prayer, please?